Shabbat Shalom. Like an archaeologist unearthing a long forgotten artifact, this week I ventured into the deepest corners. It's okay. This week, I ventured into the deepest corners of my apartment storage locker to unearth a treasure that has not been touched since we arrived some 10 years ago. The dust-covered object is a nondescript box whose contents, which though may or may not be of any monetary worth, have sentimental value, at least to me, beyond measure. Inside of the box are hundreds and hundreds of comic books. Comic books I collected week after week, year after year, for about three years of my preteen life. Spider-Man, Captain America, The Avengers, Iron Man, The Fantastic Four, X-Men, amongst others, the sacred scripture of my early adolescence. Every Friday afternoon after school, I would skateboard down to the local comic book store. I would buy the new titles of the week, and slurpy in hand, I would skateboard home. I would read each comic in a specific sequence, saving my favorite titles till the end, and then I'd ritually slip each one into its very own polypropylene protective bag, until, of course, I remove them to read again and again and again. To this day, I can still recall the combination of my parents' curiosity and disdain as I poured my time, my money, and my brain cells into a fantasy world of superheroes and villains. In fact, when Debbie and I got to our first apartment in Chicago shortly after we were married, my mother unceremoniously shipped me my box of comics <laughs> with a post-it attached saying something to the effect of, Mazel Tov on your new home, now get your stuff out of my house. <laughs> I suppose I should be grateful that she didn't just throw it all out and extend it to me the courtesy of storing them myself, which is exactly what I have done ever since, until this week. Because this past week, in the midst of election recounts, slow, snowplow fiascos, California fires, and rockets in Israel, a momentous passing occurred. The death of Stan Lee at the age of 95. For those of you who don't know, Stan Lee was perhaps the central player in the rise of the comic book industry as we know it today. Hired in 1940 by Timely Comics, as the first issues of Captain America were being prepared, Lee rose rapidly from errand boy to proofreader to storyboard writer and eventually editor and art director. In the 1960s, under Lee and Jack Kirby's leadership, Marvel Comics launched a successful slew of titles, including The Incredible Hulk, The Mighty Thor, Daredevil, and many, many others. Whether or not you yourself have ever read a comic book, the cultural imprint the comic book industry has had on American popular culture is hard to deny. The comics themselves, the billion dollar juggernaut of a movie industry, the comic conventions, video games, merchandising, and most of all, the millions of imaginations stirred every week. Subjectively, objectively, by any metric, one can easily make the case for Stan Lee as one of the towering generators of American culture in the 20th and 21st century. Which is why, in this sanctuary, on this Shabbat, I want to take note that Lee was a Jew. Lee's given name was Stanley Lieber, his parents' Romanian Jewish immigrants who settled in the Bronx. Lee was a graduate of DeWitt Clinton High School, a setting that gave rise to people like Lee, 
Richard Rogers, and Ralph Lauren, some of the most remarkable Jewish shapers of the aspirational American dream. The aforementioned Jack Kirby was born Jacob Kurtzberg to a family of Austrian Jews who settled on the Lower East Side. Kirby and Lee collaborated with Joe Simon, the creator of Captain America, born Jaime Simon, also to immigrant parents. From Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, both sons of Jewish immigrants and creators of action comic Superman, to Al Jaffe of Mad Magazine fame, born Abraham Jaffe, the Jewish role in the American comic book industry cannot be overstated. I raise the Jewish fact, the fact of the Jewish roots of the comic industry's founding fathers, not in order to play the always fun yet awkwardly self-congratulatory parlor game of identifying Jewish exceptionalism. <laughs> there are, frankly, many people, my mother included, who may wonder whether humanity would not have been better served had not all that Jewish brain power been better directed. <laughs> I raise the fact of the Jewish origins of the comic book industry because it begs the question of why. Why is it that so many Jews found their home in this world of heroes and villains, superpowers and secret identities, alter egos and alternate realities? With one debated exception about which I know, Benjamin Grimm, one quarter of the Fantastic Four, none of the heroes were explicitly Jewish. Notwithstanding the barriers that prevented Jews from entering the more respectable side of American publishing in that era, what exactly was the gravitational pull that drew so many of our kinsmen, and they were all men at the time, into this realm of creative endeavor? Some of the connections are more obvious than others and predate Lee himself. In 1938, when Siegel and Schuster created Superman, they did so in response to, quote, hearing and reading of the oppression and slaughter of helpless, oppressed Jews in Nazi Germany. At risk of stating the obvious, what is the story of Superman if not the story of a baby Moses, Kal El sent away in a vessel from a world facing annihilation, only to be discovered in a rural setting, raised with a hidden identity, until that fateful day when this stuttering Gentile Clark Kent goes to the metropolis, only to find the fate of civilization resting on his shoulders. The plot line is also reminiscent of the mythical creature from Jewish literature called the Golem, which whether Siegel, Schuster, and others were familiar, certainly offers precedent for a legendary figure of superhuman strength capable of saving the Jewish people time and again in crisis. The backdrop of World War II is omnipresent in, war in those years. No longer just bank robbers and aliens, but Nazis were to become the embodiment of comic book evil. The 1941 debut issue of Kirby's Captain America features our red, white, and blue hero surrounded by an ethnically diverse platoon delivering a right hook to Hitler's jaw. Not an insignificant statement given the isolationist sentiments of many of our countrymen who were then actively discouraging America's entry into the war. Lee's significance is that he didn't just receive the literary tropes as established by his predecessors, but he developed them to reflect the changing sensibilities of his era. The stiff gentility of Superman's Clark Kent was replaced by the schlamazel Woody Allen-esque quality of Spider-Man's Peter Parker. So too the comic patter of Spider-Man's crime fighting or Daredevil's vigilantism or the Hulk's uncontrollable rage reflected altogether different notions of what constitutes heroic behavior. Unlike his predecessors, Lee bestowed upon his heroes and their alter egos texture and flaws, always playing with the manner by which the two sides of their hyphenated identities informed one another. And of course, what every storyline shared was not just the success or failure of a superhero's mission, but also the ongoing struggle of that hero to fulfill the mission while balancing the tug of war of their own identities. The implicit drama of Stanley's universe is that humanity's saving deeds can be performed by our heroes only when that private citizen dons a mask 
thus enabling his or her superpowers to come to the fore. Finally, did you ever think your rabbi knew so much about comics? <laughs> Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't at least make passing mention of my personal favorite and the most commercially viable of Lee's creation, the X-Men. In 1963, Lee and Kirby developed the premise of the X-Men, a category of human beings endowed with a variety of abilities that manifest themselves right around the time of Bar Mitzvah. The subtext of the entire series is the degree to which these uncanny outsiders who save humanity time and time again will ever be accepted by the very host society that depends on their heroics. The villainous mutants are led by Magneto, I think a Holocaust survivor, whose war against humanity reflects his cynicism regarding the ability of the mutant minority from achieving peace with the human majority. It is a genteel and gentile Professor X and his multicultural mutant team who repeatedly put themselves in, on the line in their forlorn hope of peaceful coexistence. Could these themes have been developed by non-Jews? Perhaps. Certainly their wide and warm reception by the general public would suggest that there's nothing necessarily Jewish about them. Like all great art, the lines aren't always clear and the subtext not always explicit. But even the most conservative reader would at least have to concede that the nature of these storylines seems to at least run parallel to the very anxieties of the American Jewish experience in a post-Holocaust America. In fact, one could go so far, so I will, as to suggest that Lee's vision reflects a typological struggle that long predates the 60s and 70s and dates back, well, all the way to the very beginning. Ever since last week's Torah reading and the wrestling match within Rebecca's womb, the competing possibilities of our people's identity has been present. Jacob, a Peter Parker-like dweller of tents and the recipient of a blessing, and Esau, a muscular outdoorsman, formidable and fierce. Ever since this week's Torah reading, Jews have wondered just how long we can dwell in the house of Laban before losing our distinction and be for our hosts turn on us. And ever since next week's Torah reading, Jews have dreamt of that momentous wrestling match between the competing notions of our self-understanding as one emerges victorious, limping, but shalem, whole, renamed as Israel and proudly unmasked in the fullness of our being. As I've noted on many occasions, the 50s, 60s, and 70s were fascinating years of transition for an upwardly mobile and increasingly accepted post-Holocaust American Jewry with the state of Israel contending with old, age-old issues of identity and power in new, fascinating, and sometimes uncomfortable ways. Consciously or unconsciously, Stan Lee's oeuvre draws on the most traditional tropes of our people in the medium of a comic book, a modern midrash on the transformations he witnessed in American Jewish life. All of which brings us back to the question of our moment. This week, I picked up the phone to a dear old college friend of mine who spent some years working at Marvel. He shared with me that while he does have Jewish colleagues, the comic book industry is no longer the Jewish industry it once was. The changes in the comic industry reflect all that has changed in the world and the Jewish world since Lee's heyday. Jews are no longer the other, but just another in the symphony of American life, and there are now others, others, seeking entry into the American dream as we once did. And while it's been years since I've purchased a comic book, as my dear colleague Rabbi Witkowski taught us on the holidays, these days the requirements for heroism have changed. A hero's world-saving power is no longer contingent on his or her willingness to put on a mask. Not only may we, but we are called on to save the world with both our powers and our identities in full display. And so I watched my 13-year-old son flip through those dusty comic books this week with curiosity, noting all that has changed since I bought them so many years ago. And I also thought to myself that even with all the time that's passed, some things never change. We're still in need of heroes, 
In fact, maybe now more than ever. None of us need to look far to see a world in need of being saved, a world in need of tikkun, of repair. Ours, in an er ours is an era in desperate need of heroes capable of fighting for truth and justice. Perhaps more than anything, ours is an era in search of hope, which I think, when all is said and done, what comics are really about, hope. For as long as Jews have been Jews, our calling card has been that hope, to be an exemplar, a light unto nations. And here in America, we have the wherewithal and the power to exercise that openly. As Uncle Ben once said to his nephew, Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility. In those days and in ours, it's a call to action to which we must pay heed and may the memory of Stan Lee be for a blessing. Shabbat Shalom.